I am recording now. Okay. There we go. Very good. All right. I am going to share my screen here and we will get going. Okay. Can uh, Jay, can you see the screen and can you I hear can me? See your screen. Yep. Okay. Uh, I can see the screen and hear you. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction, Jay. And uh, uh, just so all of you know, Jay has been doing this for his entire life, I think. And I, I don't know how many hundreds or, well, no, how many thousands of people he has uh, been a help to. He, uh, he makes it his passion to help everyone in the preparedness process. And so thank you, Jay, for that. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I know you've all got other things you could be doing, um, but I appreciate the fact that you are interested and concerned about what's going on in our world and that you are wanting to be part of the solution. That is, um, that's what we need to be doing and we need more people like you joining us. So we're gonna go ahead and get going again. This is backup power, keeping the lights and other stuff on. Um, we're not gonna dive too deep into this. This isn't gonna be very technical because um, the idea here is just to give you some idea of, of uh, what you can do, what you want to do, and how to go about it. So let's kick this off. Um, so why backup power? For those of you here in Utah, back in September of 2020, we had some horrific winds that uh, did a lot of damage, and there were a lot of people without power for some period of time, um, up to a week, maybe more. Um, and then you look at the polar vortex in Texas in the south, um, tremendous amount of damage and uh, even loss of life because power systems went down. Um, the rolling blackouts that we hear about in California, other weather events, um, you know, maybe it's a heat wave. For, for, for Texas, it was the polar vortex. For, for places like us where we know what it is to be cold, you know, maybe we have an extended heat wave that puts tremendous stress on our electrical systems. And, uh, you know, perhaps we lose our power. Um, something that we're prone to here is earthquake. Um, other people, it might be tornadoes or hurricanes or, you know, whatever that weather thing might be or that natural disaster might be. Um, cyber attacks, uh, that has been in the news lately um, and, and quite a bit. And, and the potential for, you know, power systems going down because of cyber attacks is very real. Um, EMP, natural or man-produced, solar storms, high altitude uh, nuclear detonation uh, with everything going on right now in Russia and Ukraine, that has been threatened. Um, not, not in so many words, but I think those of us who, who know the, the potential outcomes understand that that is one of the weapons that could be used. Um, we're just hopefully getting right to the end of a, a minor pandemic, but if we had a more severe pandemic, uh, we might see um, lots more power outages as people aren't able to show up for work and there's stresses on our systems. Um, you know, we could go on and on and on, and I don't mean to be the, the bearer of bad news or be pessimistic. I'm just throwing out here some realities that, that we need to think about. Uh, we can take some steps to, to provide peace of mind and to bless our lives and the lives of our families and the lives of our neighbors. Um, I am so, so much an advocate of, um, of community, of working together, of building, building together and helping each other out. And so, um, you know, this gives us the ability to do that. So where do we begin? Um, the first thing that we need to decide is how much energy you need to run your critical loads. So what are your critical loads? You need to decide what is it that I need to run? Um, if you're independently wealthy, you can afford to run your entire house. That's not a problem. If you're like most of us who have to kind of pick and choose, we can't build a system that big uh, to run everything that we want to run. So what are your critical loads? Is that medical equipment? For a lot of people, that's what drives this whole thing is they have, you know, an oxygen concentrator or a, a CPAP machine or some other piece of medical equipment that they need to, to maybe stay alive or to at least 
live comfortably. Um, you know, for a lot of people, it's a fridge or a freezer, um, the ability to communicate or, or lighting. <laughs> and so, you know, what are, what are your critical loads? Decide what those are, because that's how we start this process is deciding what is it that I'm going to plan for. Since I can't plan for everything, what are the most important things? So this is an example of that. This, this is my mother. She um, uses an oxygen concentrator at night. Um, and so, you know, she could probably get by without it if she had to, but it, it makes her life better. So uh, this is one example of something that you could run. Now, um, this machine actually wouldn't, uh, it actually draws a fair amount of energy. So, you know, she might only be able to use it for a few hours and then have to recharge this power station that's sitting by it. But it gives her that ability to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. This is another, uh, that same power station. I'm just test running my freezer with it. And I'm, I've got the solar panels out on the driveway that's recharging that as it is powering my freezer. And, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm, I was born without a personality. So, you know, I, I love numbers. I love spreadsheets. I love measuring things. I love um, figuring all this out. It, it makes my brain happy. So, um, but this is just some examples of how you might use backup power. So after you decide what it is that you want to run, what your critical loads are, the next thing that you need to do is calculate how much energy that's going to use. <coughs> um, you can do that in, in a few ways. One is there's a label on every appliance or device. It's gonna tell you how many watts or how many amps that device is gonna pull. Now, a lot of times those aren't real accurate. Um, that might be a maximum number and it doesn't always run at that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an, an estimation that they have to put on that device. Um, the other way you can do it is, you know, look it up online, just put in a search, you know, what does my freezer cost around? Of course, that's gonna depend on your freezer. Is it efficient? Is it old? Is it new? Um, you know, those are just gonna be estimates as well. The one that I really like um, is these little power consumption meters. Uh, these are available fairly inexpensively. Um, the ones that I buy are usually between $15 and $40. Uh, so really not a lot of money, uh, considering the value that they give you, the ability to measure these. And, and these measure in two different ways. Uh, you can, this, this will measure your instantaneous use. You can look on there and you can see them instantaneously, you know, how many watts that's drawing, how many amps that's drawing. Um, of course, it shows you your voltage and your um, and other information, but the, the ones you're really usually considering is your watts and your amps. So um, these are great little tools. I, I really love these. I've worn out several of them, but uh, these do just an excellent job. And if you want good information, this is the way to go. The thing I really, really like about these is that you can use these to, you know, you're gonna plug that into the wall and then you're gonna plug your device into it. In the case of like a refrigerator or freezer, this is where this thing really shines because your fridge or your freezer is gonna turn on long enough to get the temperature where it should be and then it turns off. It turns on, off, on, off. And so you can't really get a good accurate picture of how much energy you're using uh, by just looking at instantaneous numbers. You, you wanna see, you know, you're going to plug that thing in. I like to plug it in for a week or a month. And then I can really see, okay, it goes on and off and on and off. But, but over a month's period of time, this is how much energy it takes. Um, so that's the real value in these is getting that picture of, of how much energy you need on an average basis. Um, so I, again, these are fairly inexpensive. You can get more expensive ones out there. You can get really fancy ones, but I'm, I'm just pretty much low tech. I like uh, seeing what I need to see and these, these devices do it. You can see that middle one uh, has some black spots on the screen. I, I dropped it and that um, totally messed it up. So that one went right in the trash after this picture. But uh, um, anyway, if, if you're serious about this, I would, I would certainly get a device like this. Um, I picked these up on Amazon. 
Um, they're, like I said, they're fairly inexpensive and they provide you with so much good information. So after you get a feel for how much energy you need, then you're gonna take a look at, okay, what are my options? Um, and these are generally speaking fuel-based, which are your generators that we're mostly familiar with. And then um, a solar battery kind of combination that will allow you to meet your needs. And each one of these comes in a variety of sizes. Each of these has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and that's what we're here about tonight is looking at all our options and then being able to make good decisions about what's gonna, what's gonna best meet our needs. So um, if, if we start with the fuel-based generators, um, you'll wanna decide what fuel is, is gonna be most appropriate for you. Uh, gasoline is, is very common. Um, you know, a lot, you could get it, siphon it out of a car if you had to. Um, it is a little more dangerous to store than some fuels, but you can store it safely. But I encourage you to store it not only safely, but legally so that we don't end up with a problem. Um, um, gasoline systems are, are good. That gasoline does need to be stabilized if you're gonna store it for some period of time. So I would recommend a good stabilizer. Um, diesel has more energy per gallon and it stores better and safer, but in the wintertime, you can have issues with gelling. Um, and so again, Factor all this in and, and decide what's going to work for you. Um, diesel um, is not quite as common, but uh, it, like I said, it does have a lot of energy in it. So that is an option for you. Uh, propane. Uh, propane is less energy per gallon than gasoline. Um, but generally speaking, it's safer to store. I like the canisters. I like the ability to... Uh, to store that and I feel more comfortable storing that. It's, I think it's a, a safer way to go. Um, and then natural gas. Uh, this one's a little less common for most generators. There are some tri-fuel generators out there that do use um, gasoline, propane or natural gas. Um, and so you can look at that. We'll talk a little more about that when we talk about the, the generators. But uh, some of the systems using natural gas would be systems that tie right to your home. And these, I, I really like these systems. Generac makes one. There's a lot of companies that make them out there and they are tied right to your home. And um, the nice thing is when the power goes out, uh, the transfer switch flips and your power comes right back on because they're using natural gas. And of course, uh, perhaps in a long-term grid outage, um, we may have trouble with our, our natural gas systems um, since Basically, everything we do relies on energy. Um, so just recognize that natural gas may be a good one, but at some point it may run out as well if, if natural gas systems go down. Um, so now let's talk about two different types of generators. There's your standard generator. These have been around for a very long time. Um, they're generally larger. I mean, they come in a whole variety of sizes, but you can get uh, fairly large sizes. Um, more power. Uh, one thing that uh, a downside to them is they, they don't adjust to the load. They're running at a standard 3,600 RPMs. And whether you're running, charging your phone or, or running something large, they run at the same rate. Um, so um, something to consider there. Uh, one issue is noise. Most of these generators are fairly noisy. Um, and sometimes we don't want to attract attention to ourselves. Uh, so something to factor in the equation. Um, and, and another significant factor is for most of these standard generators, your power is not going to be as clean. Um, your waveform isn't going to be a, a nice, clean, pure sine wave, but rather it's going to be a some kind of a a modified sine wave, and some of the the uh, fine electronics can't handle that. I've known people who have blown out TVs and other things because it just couldn't handle dirty power coming out of a generator. So um, I, I think that's a significant factor. There's just another picture of a small um, generator. Um, 
the next type of fuel based generator is the inverter generator and i'm i'm a huge fan of the inverter generators this is a newer technology uh, and they are more efficient they will adjust to your load so if you're running something smaller they throttle back if they're running larger then they're going to throttle up uh, so they are more efficient they're pretty easy to maintain and one thing that's really nice about these is they are very quiet, uh, much, much quieter than, than most of your standard generators. Uh, they have that clean wave form that we've talked about, the nice clean sine wave, because they are an inverter. They are um, actually generating DC power and then converting that to AC power, the kind of power that you use in your home. Um, but they do that, that inverter makes a very, very clean sine wave. Um, generally speaking, these are very portable and they're scalable. So uh, if you if you can see on the side of this generator, it's 2000 watt, it's a 2000 watt generator, but if I need to run 3500 watts, you can put two of these in parallel. Uh, they give they can provide you the cords and you can put two of them in parallel and run that load. So they are scalable. Um, that that is a, a real good fact, uh, nice factor as well. Uh, they are more expensive, and generally speaking, and you're starting to see some some fairly large um, inverter generators. But generally speaking, they're on the lower end. 1,000 watts, 2,000 watts are the most common, um, or in that range. So, you know, just some things to think about. Um, so here's just another picture of that same generator. This is one that I picked up at Sam's Club. Um, and it was um, that Honda, the Hondas are kind of the Cadillac out there. They are, well, I don't know if Cadillac is the right word now, but, but they are kind of the standard, the Honda, but they're fairly pricey. Um, so this one is, a, is about a 2000 watt uh, using gasoline or 1800 watts using propane. This is a dual fuel um, and of course, that is a great thing because what we're looking for when we're looking at preparedness is options, having options. So with this one, if you've got more access to propane, then you can run it off propane. If you go, have more access to gasoline, you can run it off that. So um, this one, I think was about $450. I think I got it on sale for about $400 and it rates really well. It's not quite rated quite as well as the Honda, but it's rated pretty close. I mean, it's, it's really good. And there's, there's some others out there. So look around if you're interested in an inverter generator, um, you know, see what you can find at a good price. Uh, but think about the dual fuel or maybe even the tri-fuel capability. Um, so some of the advantages um, of these generators is generally speaking, they're somewhat portable. Uh, they provide great power uh, as far as quantity. Uh, the disadvantages is uh, you have to you have to be safe and legal in your fuel storage. You've got to have fuel. If you don't have fuel, it's just an expensive lawn ornament. So uh, you really need to make sure you have fuel to run this thing. Uh, you have carbon monoxide issues. You cannot run this in your home or even in your garage. Uh, we had a couple here in the Salt Lake area a few years back, and they needed their it was an older couple, they needed their oxygen equipment. And so they put the generator in the garage and, uh, and then just run the cord through the door. So it was only open a quarter of an inch, but it asphyxiated them. So you, you cannot run these anywhere. You have to have this away from any opening. You, you don't want to take that risk. You don't want to make a bad situation worse. So um, be careful of carbon monoxide. And again, the noise issue. Um, they do require regular maintenance. Um, you should probably run them at least quarterly, pull it out, start it up, make sure it's working well, um, use fuel stabilizer, you know, put it back in and put it away. Uh, but you do need to take care of it. And I would recommend having a few spare parts on hand because if you end up using this a lot and you have something fail, um, I, would, I would recommend having a few spare parts. Talk to your small engine guy and find out what would be the most likely things to go out are, are things that would be easy for you to store um, and have, have some spare parts available. So that's been a fire hose full and now we're ready to give you another fire hose full. Do we have any questions real quick before I move on? OK, 
Okay, not hearing any, so let's keep rolling. Uh, hopefully you're taking some notes, um, thinking about some of this, uh, and you will be able to have access to this recording. So um, take advantage of that. But, uh, you know, I hope that you're taking some notes to kind of zero in on what's going to work for you. So let's talk a little bit about solar and battery-based systems. And uh, we're going to talk about three items here. Uh, first, first thing, rooftop solar. And, uh, you know, most of us are pretty familiar with seeing this on roofs. Um, but one thing you need, need to remember about this is in most cases, these people aren't going to have power when, when the grid goes down either. These are grid tied systems. They're meant to tie right into the power system. And so, you know, when, when the power goes off, they don't have any access either. Now, if you're considering doing rooftop solar, uh, work with a company because there are companies out there that will work with you on a backup power system. Um, some kind of, and this will vary, different companies offer different things. My neighbor has one where she has one plug that she can use. So when that sun's shining on her panels, she's got one plug that she can use. That was, that's one form. And, and that, you know, that's not a bad way to go. Uh, you could run your fridge or your freezer during the day and then they'll be fine overnight. Um, just you wouldn't have anything at night without storage, but uh, that's an option. Others put in like a power wall um, so that you have that power, you know, that storage. Um, so yeah, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're looking for backup power and you wanna do rooftop solar, make sure that you do work with someone who will put in a backup power system for you. Um, now let's just talk about these uh, home power systems, solar power systems. Um, so let's talk about the components here. That, of course, the solar panels are a part of that. Um, we're, we're all probably pretty familiar with solar panels. Um, and, and you have a variety of ways to mount those. You can roof mount them. You can mount them on the side of a building. You're going to want to, in the northern hemisphere, you're going to want to orient those to the south. Um, I think it's kind of funny because I see all kinds of systems. I, I'm always looking and, you know, it used to be all, all these solar panels were mounted on south. Um, but now I guess solar panels have become relatively inexpensive. Now they're mounting them on the east sides and west sides and north sides. And it's, it's kind of crazy to me, but, uh, you know, I guess people who don't have a, a good south um, exposure or a place to put it, you know, you're going to put it where you can. But uh, again, so the solar panels, uh, then on the interior here, you've got um, your charge controller, which is right there, kind of on the right side, the Outback um, charge controller. And this controls the amount of charge that's going to the batteries. It's monitoring the batteries. Um, you don't want to overcharge those batteries or you destroy them. So this, the job of that charge controller is to just manage those batteries, make sure that the, that the charge, the electricity coming in um, is using to charge those batteries too efficient. And, and when they're full, it shuts them off. Um, and there's a variety of, of technologies there, but uh, in general, that's what that does. Then over there, more on the left side, the Outback um, sign on those inverters. Uh, and that's what takes that energy out of the batteries and converts it into energy that you can use for your home. The, the 110 and, and a lot of them will do a 220 as well. Um, 220 volt, 110 volt. Um, so those are two of the components. And then we saw the batteries earlier and here's another set of batteries. Uh, these are, um, in this case, they're the Iron Edison. Uh, there's a variety of chemistries out there, but you can see they take up a fair amount of room and you have to have this room vented because in, in most of these batteries, not in the lithium, but in most of these uh, lead acid type batteries, uh, they are pumping off hydrogen as they charge. And so this room has to be vented to make sure you don't uh, have a giant explosion. Um, anyway, this is, this is the battery. So there are, there are the four components, the solar panels, the charge controller, the batteries kind of next in line, and then the inverter that uh, takes that energy out of the battery and makes it usable for us. This is another example of a solar power system. This one's portable. Um, and a lot of people like these for cabins. 
uh, because instead of putting some system up there that might, if they go up in the winter, it might be covered with three feet of snow or been vandalized or whatever. In this case, you can drag this up, you can plug it into your cabin and uh, away you go. This one happens to have, um, of course, the solar panels. It's got the batteries there in the gray and black in the middle of the bottom. And then it's got a, a generator, um, a diesel generator in case you hit a time where you're, you don't get any solar for a week or so. Um, then that generator can kick on. And then in that front panel, you've got your charge controller and your inverters and, and some of the other electronics, the other um, electrical components. So that's just another interesting um, option, something that you can, uh, you can think on. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about portable power stations. And these are generally speaking, just like the other portable or the other solar power systems, but kind of on a smaller scale. So you can see me there holding the solar panel in my right hand and the power station in my left. This one happens to be a thousand watt hours of storage. Um, and, and those other three components that we talked about are uh, in that little box, the charge controllers in there, the, uh, the battery storage, in this case, lithium is in there, and then the inverter is in that box. So this is a handy option for a lot of people uh, who just want a small power system and don't want to have to maintain things. Uh, you know, it's, it's all kind of all in one little package there. So um, here you can see a picture of it being charged by the solar panels. Um, and here's another, just another setup. This is the Jackery brand. Um, have it out on my driveway charging using uh, actually four sets of panels there charging the two stations. Um, so these, these little power stations, uh, they're really handy but you have to remember that they have their limitations as well. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Here's another, you can see I've got solar panels on the side of my house here. These are just sitting on the ground. They're just a little uh, legs that fold out on these and you can see the cord going in the window. So I've got the cord going in, charging a power station inside. Um, so just, you know, some options of how you can go about this um, with these little portable power stations. Um, this one, this brand, they, uh, and the EcoFlow brand, um, they seem to kind of be out on the cutting edge of a lot of things. Um, this system right here, you can see you've got the little portable power station on the left there with the solar in the background, but then it's got an extra battery on the side. So, so you're not just limited to the power in that or the energy in that uh, power station, but you have an extra battery that you can plug in. Um, so, you know, this, this whole world is evolving crazily. Uh, these haven't been on the market for too long. You know, a few years they've been out there, but there's all kinds of things. They're, they're making them larger. Uh, that's the biggest trend right now is they're making these larger and larger. Um, some with, you know, with extra batteries. Um, and so that, you know, you'll just want to weigh all this in. If this is something that you want to do, you want to take a look at, you know, what options are, are right for you because there's no one right option for everybody. It's, it's somewhat, you know, you need to customize it to what you need. Um, again, this is uh, just showing the Jackery brand. Um, and I, I, I don't endorse any of these brands. I, these are just ones that I've tried out. I've, I've worked with a little bit. Uh, there's a, a lot of good brands, but there's also a lot of brands out there that I don't know much about. There's, if you look on, say, Amazon, there's all kinds of names. Some of them I can't even pronounce. You know, everybody wants in this game. And so, um, you know, you just do need to be a little careful. You need to know what you need to look for and, uh, and find the right one for you. Uh, here you can see I'm using a portable power station to wash, run my washing machine. Um, and and I'm, I'm pleased this, this washing machine is extremely efficient. Um, and these little portable power stations can run them. And, and that to me is a good use of my energy. You know, we talked about critical loads and my wife just defined that list for me. And one of them was her washing machine. 
which I totally get because doing laundry by hand is is kind of a pain. So if I can if I can run this, um, you know that's great. Here's another picture of another power station running the washing machine, um, and it and it does really well. Um, this one I'm I'm running the dryer, and I decided that's not worth my energy. You know when we're talking about in a crisis situation and and having a certain amount of energy that we can use for all of our needs, might, which might include medical or fridge freezer or you know whatever those critical loads are. Um, this is a, actually a gas dryer, so I'm not using this to to provide the heat. That's natural gas providing the heat. I'm just tumbling the clothes, but it uses a fair amount of energy to run that dryer. So, you know, to me, that's not worth the use of energy. I've got a clothesline outside. It's not that hard for me to hang those clothes out on the line and let them dry out in the sun um, and the wind. So, you know, here, it's just showing things that you, you can do. Just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it because you're trying to manage that, you know, perhaps a, a small amount of energy to get the most out of it. And in this case, that, that, that doesn't include my dryer. Um, here you can see I'm running a, a little hot plate. And again, just because I can do it doesn't mean that I should do it because uh, I recommend that people don't try and do air conditioning, heating, or um, cooking with these little power stations or with, with a solar power system in general. Find other ways to do that. You know, I can, I can run a fan with this, without any problem and they don't use that much energy if you have a good efficient fan. Um, but air conditioning will will suck this thing dry in you know a matter of an hour it's gone. All the storage in there is totally gone. So um, again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I would find alternatives for cooking, for cooling and for heating. If you can find other ways to do that, then you focus that energy on running your fridge or your freezer or your medical equipment, whatever is critical for you. Um, I should mention here, let's, let's before I go on to this slide, um, when you're looking at these portable power stations, you, you're looking really at three numbers to me that, that are significant, things that you want to consider. Uh, first of all is the, the amount of storage that it has. Um, you saw that little Jackery portable power station, it only has um, 167 watt hours, I think. Um, some of the bigger ones have, you know, 3,600 watt hours or 6,000 watt hours. So there's this whole huge range of, of your storage, which is measured in watt hours. Then you have um, your watts. How much energy can this put out? How big of a device can I run with this thing? Uh, and again, you've got the full range. You've got some that it can only put out, you know, maybe 100 watts or a little more, um, and some that can put out several thousand watts. So um, watch for that. And, and the third number that you're looking at, and the one that probably is probably as significant as anything to me, is how much solar can I put in that thing? Um, because an important part of this is going to be getting that power bank charged back up. So how much solar can I put in? Um, some of them you can only put in one or 200 watts um, and some of them not even that much, 60 watts. Um, and some of them you can put in thousands of watts. So your ability to recharge that is important. So again, those three numbers are your storage in watt hours, um, the amount of energy it can put out in watts, and then the amount of energy you can put in using solar. Uh, and again, all of those vary widely in the systems out there. And, you know, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but sometimes people think these power stations are a, a magic box that can just do everything. And, you know, they can't. They have their limitations. Depending on what you have, you only have the ability to, to run certain things or to input certain amounts of solar energy. So uh, make sure that you uh, look at those three numbers when you're figuring out what you're going to, what you're going to do. Um, oh, let's go back here. Okay, so the advantages of these solar battery systems are you don't have any fuel to store, um, and there's no carbon monoxide, and they're silent. So those advantages to me are significant. Um, you know, just those three are 
it's very, very significant. There's the things that you need to consider in a crisis situation. Um, disadvantages, in, in a lot of cases, they're less powerful. As I said, they're getting more and more, these, these systems are getting larger and larger. Um, and with most of the solar power systems, uh, your batteries are, can be a weak point. Uh, I'm referring mostly to the solar, you know, a solar home system. Um, you know, those batteries eventually wear out and you have to replace them and you have to care for them. Um, one of the, the things that I'm pretty concerned about is EMP susceptibility with like these power stations or with your solar power system. Um, they are vulnerable to, to EMP. Uh, so you need to consider that. Um, with, the, with the lithium batteries, and I haven't been able to nail this down tight, but uh, the people that I've talked to said, because, okay, let's back up a little bit. Those, those lithium batteries that are in these power stations or in the power walls, they are managed by a battery management system um, referred to as the BMS, battery management system. And that that tells that system when it can charge and when it can. That's based on temperature, on charge. Uh, that battery management system manages those batteries. And if that battery management system is disabled by EMP or fails, um, then you have a problem. Um, and so, you know, that, that's something to think about under those disadvantages. Uh, the maintenance of these, if you're talking about the large um, home sized solar power system, and you're, and you're dealing with lead acid batteries, you're gonna have to irrigate those. You're gonna have to add water to those periodically, um, distilled water, and you need to do equalizing charges with them. So, you know, they do require a little bit of maintenance. And again, we talked about spare parts before. I would have spare parts on hand. Um, I, I'm not as concerned about the solar panels and the uh, battery storage, but the inverters and the charge controllers I think are, are fairly susceptible to, to EMP and having those spare parts. So if you're gonna do this, you wanna have some spare parts or with these portable power stations, I would keep them in a, uh, a Faraday box uh, to keep them from, from being impacted. So, uh, and, and a lot, most of these little power stations, if you've got any kind of a decent sized Faraday box, you can fit it in there nicely. And I, and I would, I would store it in there. Also under storage recommendations, um, of course, we'd like to have those full. Uh, we're, we're doing a balancing act here on, this, on your storage because um, ideally the lithium batteries you wanna store at about 50% if you're gonna store them for long-term. Um, but as preppers, we want to be able to pull that out and have as much energy available to us uh, as we can. So, um, you know, I've landed on about 75% having that solar power station or the portable power station up at about 75%. Um, that increases the longevity of the, the battery system if you don't store them completely full. Um, so it's a balancing act. You know, I've, I've talked to people on all the extremes, some that store it at 50%, some that store it at 100% because they say, you know, yeah, I'm, I know I'm going to lose you know, my battery is going to degrade a little faster if I do that, but I want that all that energy when I need it. Um, like I said, I've landed at about 75%. I charge it up to 75% and, and store it that way. And, uh, you know, I, again, with these, probably want to pull it out of that Faraday cage every three or four months um, and just check it, make sure it's working, um, and then, then put it back in. So, that's just a, a couple of things on uh, storage. All right, so now question and answer. I, I think we've got a few minutes if, if there are some questions. Um, and Jay, maybe you can feed those to me or if people want to, to ask a question. Um, I, I will mention to you that in my opinion, the best system is a combination of these having a solar power station that you can run most of your loads with. Um, and then, you know, of course, if you hit a week of stormy winter, you're gonna lose your storage in there fairly fast. And then I would use 
the inverter generator to charge that back up. And that inverter generator has enough uh, power that I can not only be charging the power station, I can be running the freezer and the fridge and run a batch of laundry. Um, so I, I would take advantage of that time if I had to charge it using the fuel-based generator. I would be doing a bunch of other stuff at the same time. So uh, to me, that's the ideal system is is not one or the other, but if you can if you can see your way clear to do both and, and back up your solar, use your solar as much as you possibly can and back it up with the fuel base, that's that's the system that I recommend. But you know, everyone needs to do what is right for them and, and what will fit within their budget. So anyway, uh, let's let's move to some questions if there are some. Jonathan, I was just going to, uh, you know, I had a comment. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, you know, a hybrid system is is the best. You just have to learn how to use it. And if you can have your solar system carrying the main load and then only run the generator, you know, every other day for a half an hour or an hour or something like that, uh, right. that would be ideal. You can serve your fuel, but you have access to uh, your uh, AC power essentially 24 hours a day uh, with one, yeah. of these, uh, one of these things. Just yeah. saw a question coming on the chat. Interested in a portable power station, something fairly lightweight due to health issues. Are those chargeable with a wall plug while we have power? Uh, they are still chargeable. Have more panels possible on those to uh, add on possible. Yeah, there's, um, uh, just to answer that question, I guess to everyone. Uh, yeah, and, and, and just, uh, I, I should have mentioned this up front, but, Yes, you, you do charge these just with household power while we have it. Uh, you charge them with household power, and then we're going to rely on the, the solar panels in a crisis when we don't have that grid power available. Great question. Um, and, and then again, um, I think as it was alluded to on the solar, I would maximize your solar. I would get as much solar as you can because that's going to, that's going to make it so that you use that fuel-based generator less if you can if you can be importing more solar energy um, so much better. Hey, this is Bob. Um, instead of writing, because it would take a little bit to write what I wanted to say. If you're going to run your your big generator, your tri-gas generator, um, like the twelve thousand watt. Um, remember your duty cycle on that, that you can run it for eight hours continuous, but then you're going to need to let it set without running it for another four to eight hours. And along with um, the gas or diesel or whatever fuel you're going to use, remember you're, you're going to need spark plugs, possibly air filters. Um, those are some of the spare parts that I think you were talking about. Yeah, but definitely. Definitely. The main, the main point was watch the duty cycle because you will burn your inverter up if you run it for too long and try and run it for you know 24 hours straight. You're gonna you're gonna fry your inverter. Yeah, so be yeah careful you there. do have to you do have to be careful and make sure that you uh, you don't overwork something that uh, that you're gonna rely on. Great point. Thank you. I'm just going to see here. Um, I have a comment. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you, Jonathan, for coming on. I've purchased your book and I've watched your videos online. So thank you oh, for thank you, you and everything the Takata organization does. I'm somewhat new to this, but um, your information is timely. Uh, the Department of Energy, NSA, and FBI actually just put a, a joint advisory yesterday encouraging critical infrastructure executives. Uh, throughout the power grid to harden their systems further because they found a vulnerability from overseas. <laughs> yes. So uh, obviously getting that email is a touch alarming and it's what prompted me to join your meeting tonight. So right. again, thank you for the information. It's timely. And if you want me to forward you that email from those organizations, I'd be happy to. Yeah, if you don't mind shooting that over, I, I've been kind of monitoring those things. And of course, President Biden came out of Two or three weeks ago and said you know these these cyber attacks are going to happen um 
the world political situation is um, dicey right now. And, um, it, you know, it's been shown that there is, uh, there, all, there are vulnerabilities in our power system. Um, malware that's already inserted in a lot of systems that, uh, you know, that can take them down. I think we, we live in a world where most people like to think that nothing can ever really go very wrong. And, and I hope they're right. I, I really do. I, I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, and, I, and I truly hope that we don't see serious problems. But when you look at what's happening, you know, with natural disasters, with political situations, um, you know, all kinds of things, I think it, it, it's important for us to take steps so that we can help ourselves and our families and our neighbors. Uh, and, and like I said, be a part of the solution. Thank you so much for your comments. Yes, thank you, sir. And, and, you know, connect with us on our, you can connect with us on our YouTube channel or our uh, website, the Provident Prepper. Um, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. We, we love to help people. That is, that is our mission. Um, and let me, let me give you my uh, email address. Um, and that is J.B. Jones. 0529 at gmail.com. Uh, again, JB Jones 0529 at gmail.com. You know, I, I'm I'm always happy to to help people who are really trying to to make a difference. They're trying to to protect their families and and do the wise thing. And so don't hesitate to reach out on whatever format. Um, let us know how we can help. Any other questions? Anything in the chat? Uh, I'm just answering one right now. Um, I had a question about if you use 1500 watt portable solar system, how long is the typical recharging time in the sun? How do I know I am putting enough solar into the system to keep it full? <clears throat> and, you're, and you're probably answering that, but we'll, we'll throw this out here. You know, your, your little, panel on your power station is going to tell you how fast you're charging. Um, your specifications are going to determine how fast you can put energy into that. And then, of course, your ability to have that much solar to, to maximize that is important. Um, so, yeah, you can. And I, I've talked to people who have the little power stations, but it's still in the box. Get it out of the box and, and try it because uh, the one person I talked to said, I'm just so afraid of the thing. I don't even know. I don't know how to deal with it. And, and, and I just gently encourage her, look, just pull it out. You're just going to pull it out the first time and you're going to charge it with the wall. And then next time, you know, the next day you're going to plug something into it, you know, make sure that it, that your power station is able to meet that load, but plug it in and see how it works. Watch the numbers, watch your storage. Um, go up or down, depending on if you're charging or if you're using, um, see how fast that happens. Um, again, with these portable power stations, you're, you're trying to manage a balancing act there because the faster you charge them, the more you, um, I don't want to say damage the batteries, but the, you shorten the life of those batteries. Um, they're kind of like me. I, I, I like to um, just slowly transition, I guess. Uh, and so they're, they're better if you can charge them slow, slower. Uh, it'll make them last longer. But again, in a crisis situation, you're going to need to do what you need to do to, you know, if that means charging it fast, yeah, it'll probably um, take a little bit of a toll on the back end. But the priority becomes in the short run, this is what I need to run. And so, um, but again, the slower you can charge them, the better. Uh, some of the stations pride themselves on being really fast to charge, um, which is great if you need that, but uh, you don't always want to do that if you can if you can charge it more slowly. Um, and of course, if you're plugging it in the wall, you, it's going to charge at what rate it charges. If you're plug, plugging in solar, um, you know, maybe if you don't need it immediately, you charge it a little slower to extend that battery life. I would say a good rule of thumb is, uh, you know, 5% of capacity per hour is, uh, you know, perhaps ideal. You can go 
maybe 10 or 15 percent per hour if you if you need to but uh, you know don't go too much more than that yeah so um if it's possible just want to ask a quick question uh sure. how um how robust are these systems do they are they only good for a couple of years or i, I mean the the average person such as myself is going to plug it in uh use it very rarely um how how what's the lifespan on things like that? um and these are I, I don't know that there's a real clear standard out there on on cycles but they're rated by cycles you know you discharge it you charge it that's a cycle um some of these are rated for 500 cycles some of them are rated for 2000 cycles but you you know you you don't know always if they're comparing apples with apples because if you deplete that if you run that down 10 percent and then charge it back up you're doing a lot less damage to that battery system than if you charge it you draw it all the way down to 20 percent use 80 percent of it and then charge it back up again so um you know generally speaking they're good for you know 2000 cycles so yeah somebody that's just got it for an emergency use you know it should do a good job for you for a long time that that's uh, you know, again, that's how they rate those is by by cycles. Jay, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, it, that's usually in the specifications of the system. They'll tell you how many cycles and they usually specify, you know, an 80 percent discharge or something like that per cycle. Uh, but it's all um, you should ask for or find those specifications as you're comparing systems. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, as I mentioned, you know, if, if you don't need to charge it all the way down, um, you know, I, I wouldn't. If you if you are done running loads for the day and you can spend a little time recharging it, instead of running it down to 20%, you run it down to 60% and, and recharge. Those cycles are a little easier on it than the deep cycles. And I would add most every system has a little indicator as to how how deeply discharged the um, the battery is so uh, yeah it's usually fairly easy to monitor yeah you can you can uh, monitor that and like i said i would if you get one of these systems just play with it you know watch it and and get a feel for it it's like anything else you know you like a, an animal you, you have to get a feel for you know how it works and you know when it likes what you do and when it doesn't like what you do and you know you just you get it out and play with it a little bit because that's that's going to give you a comfort level when you're in a crisis that hey I know how to do this I know how to run this I know how to use it efficiently and optimally um, so yeah get it out charge it with solar charge it with the wall run some different devices and watch the numbers on the screen you know you can see how quickly things I, I mentioned the dryer it wasn't worth it to me because I watched my my storage go down more than I wanted it to go down just to run that dryer. It's like, nope, I'm, I'm not going to use my energy that way. We'll we'll hang it out on the line and uh, we'll do it that, that way. So um, yeah, if you get one of these, just make sure you use it. It's like anything else. Practice will make all the difference. Jonathan, I might add that um, uh, people who are using the sun to recharge their systems uh, will be amazed how quickly the sun moves. You know, you uh, you see the little panels out there, you know, getting full sun, but uh, yeah. in, in an hour or two, uh, it's good to go readjust your panels and that to uh, look at the rate of charge. So, uh, you know, the, the sun does move quite quickly. So if you're, you have portable panels, uh, you have to monitor those in order to uh, keep your charge rates up. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, um, and you're right. It's, you know, you want those aimed as, as directly at the sun as you can, both on the angle and the the orientation. And you know, obviously, you don't want to go out there every five minutes and adjust it. But you know, every half hour, an hour, if you're out there, just tweak it a little bit to maximize that solar energy coming in. Great point, Jonathan. Yes. Could you give your uh, email address again, please? Yes. Yes. That is J B. Jones 0529 at gmail.com. At gmail. Thank you. Absolutely. Any last questions? It looks like we're getting close to our hour. 
I hope this has been useful to you. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being part of the solution. That's, that's who we are as preppers is we're, we're making the world better by, uh, by being that part of the solution. So um, thank you for being here. I know it was a little bit of a fire hose, but uh, you know, connect with us if, there, if you have questions. Jonathan? Yes. Uh, I joined a little late. Did you mention uh, using fuel stabilizers for gasoline storage? Um, yeah, I did a little bit, but, but let's reemphasize that point. Uh, if you are gonna be storing fuels, um, get a fuel stabilizer to help make that last longer. It, it uh, really does make a difference. I, I appreciate you mentioning that again. That's, that's important to, to make sure you don't have um, your, your fuel go south on you because you, you left it too long and it's, that, those stabilizers just make a big difference in extending that life. Well, Thank Stab you. Stabil brand claims uh, you can get 24 months of storage, but I would also point out that the stabilizer itself has a storage life. Yes, you are right there. Yeah. So there's a couple of good brands out there. Um, you know, find a good stabilizer that, that uh, will do a good job that's rated well. Uh, but yeah, do make sure you stabilize your fuels. Thank and you. With regard to reorienting your solar panels, it's been a while, but I saw some YouTube videos of uh, using water in a, like a one gallon container that will automatically aim those for you. Uh, they were used in Africa, if I recall. Interesting. So yeah. You, you might want to pursue that. There's all kinds of clever ways out there, including, I mean, if you've got your, if you've got, uh, rigid panels out there mounted on a rack. Um, there are ways that you can, you know, there are devices that you can uh, use to, to follow the sun. Uh, obviously that gives you um, more solar energy. Um, there's always been that debate. Some people say, no, just get more panels instead of buying those uh, fancy devices to move your panels, just buy more of them. Um, I don't know what the latest is on that, but, uh, but yeah, there are, there are some ways that, that uh, will help track the sun. Or uh, if, if you're just using these little panels on the ground, you, you probably just end up going out and adjusting them occasionally. I was gonna suggest, I, I use fuel stabilizer for all of my uh, small engines and that, uh, you know, just uh, especially for lawnmowers that are used seasonally or, uh, or snow blowers, whatever. If you use fuel stabilizer, it uh, definitely uh, solves a lot of carburetor issues. Yeah. Or pre prevents a lot of carburetor issues, I guess. <clears throat> that's good. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, it looks like we're about out of time. If there's any last questions, let's, uh, let's go with them or uh, I'll turn it back over to Jay and let him wrap up. Thank you, um, sir. Certainly appreciate Jonathan's time and, and efforts in putting these together. And uh, we will, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, see everyone here next month. We'll, uh, we'll be sending out a notice as usual. And in the meantime, we would encourage you to uh, join TACTA, uh, take advantage of the, uh, of the Journal of Civil Defense. Uh, and because a lot of this information is available in the, um, in the printed versions or in the electronic versions as you receive them. So. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, if you can uh, uh, send a few donations, that's always helpful. Uh, we, uh, we get by on, on uh, selling a few things, whatever, but it does take a little bit of money to, to hire someone to, to uh, mine the phones. But please do uh, feel free to call and uh, Roseanne will send, uh, forward the messages to uh, whoever the questions and we can uh, get back to you and, and try and help you in your efforts to be more prepared. So. So anyway, the key is to not, uh, not wait until tomorrow, do something today to get better prepared and, uh, and you'll be rewarded for your efforts. I'm sure. Yeah. With that, I'll say uh, good night, unless there's any other, uh, any other, uh, last minute. I forgot. Just, just thank you. That was very good. Thank you very much. Now let's go get some things done. Yeah. Go get some things done. Everybody yes, have sir. a good night. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it.